Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar highlighting the reparative description work being undertaken by Archive Space members at their organizations. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Coordinator for Archive Space, and I'm joined today by Aisha Heichel, Kate Dietrich, Laura Friedman Shedlove, Lexi de Graffenried, and Joshua Shaw. In this webinar, presenters will describe the ways they have incorporated reparative description work into their overall archival workflow and missions. Each presenter will highlight a different method for approaching this work, and all archive space and archival experience levels are welcome. A discussion will follow the presentations. The presenters and the topics they will discuss are as follows. Aisha Heikal is the Manager of Archival Services at the College of Charleston's Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. Heikal is responsible for collection development, research services, instruction, and administrative duties. In this presentation, she will be speaking about the College of Charleston's archival repositories efforts with beginning reparative description for archival collections and its connection to the college's work in understanding its history and legacy of slavery. Kate Dietrich is the archivist for the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives at the University of Minnesota, a position she has held since 2013. Laura Friedman Shedlov is the Digital Records Archivist for the Archives and Special Collections Department at the University of Minnesota and formerly Description and Access Archivist for the Coltz Family YMCA Archives at the University. In their session, Kate and Laura will discuss efforts in their, in their organization to make small but positive steps to make progress on reparative work in archive space. Lacking the resources to attempt a comprehensive project at this time, their approach so far has focused on creating guidance and tools to support and empower staff and make incremental changes. Lexi de Graffenried is the head of Special Collections Services at Penn State's Everly Family Special Collections Library, where she oversees all accessioning, processing, and collections maintenance work. She's been working on reparative description projects since summer 2019 and has been working collaboratively to build more inclusive arrangement and description workflows in both SCL and as part of a strategic plan action team. Lexi will discuss conducting a high-level audit of SCL's over 2,200 finding aids and how the results of that audit inform their reparative description projects. She will further discuss how this audit led to the development of their inclusive description working group, inclusive description style guide, and inclusive description resource guide. She will discuss the challenges they encountered in undertaking reparative description work, including challenges of not imposing identities onto LGBTQIA creators, contextualizing racist and violent materials, and adopting bilingual description in archive space. Joshua Shaw is a web and application developer at Dartmouth, Li Dartmouth Library and has been working with ArchivesSpace since 2014. He's currently part of the ArchivesSpace cross-council testing team and a member of the core committers group. In this session, Joshua will discuss the plugin he developed that adds a new subrecord in ArchivesSpace that allows staff to add content warnings and clarifying descriptions to, to accessions, resources, archival objects, and digital objects. This plugin is currently in beta phase and is still in development. Members of the community are encouraged to test the plugin and provide feedback. We will leave plenty of time for discussion and Q&A after the presentations, and we will hold all questions until the Q&A at the end. If you'd, if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and questions will be read and answered during allocated time for Q&A. If you have a general question or need some other form of assistance, please feel free to reach out in the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Aisha. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction and for the opportunity to present today. My name is Aisha Heiko, and I'm a job archival service at the College of Charleston's Avery Research Center for Adam History and Culture. Uh, we are one of four, three repositories here at the College of Charleston, um, but only two other repositories um, share instance of archive space. Um, Um, here is an outline of today's presentation. Um, give an introduction to um, who we are here at the College of Charleston. Um, uh, context to the project um, with the recreative description, uh, current effort information, and then future work here at the college. Uh, due to the history and placement of Charleston in a historic um, port of, of, of people being brought, of Africans being brought here for slavery, it has been very important to place the college um, context and the city's context in, in this role. And so from 
and in 2018, the College of Charleston um, created this Center for Studying Slavery in Charleston, um, and we joined the University, University Studying Slavery Project. Um, this was built on a history of research and scholarship here at the college, but done by faculty, students, and staff to understand um, the people that worked and labored um, around the campus. Um, and were brought to the campus for, for different jobs and those that worked in the city of Charleston. Um, and if you don't know, the College of Charleston is right downtown, um, right downtown of Charleston. And a lot of our um, buildings um, were built and used um, during the period of slavery. And so it was important for the center to be established at the college to really understand and grapple with the academic part, but also the social implications of, of this um, activity. And so um, and during this 2018 to the current period, there are working groups um, that aim to looking at different aspects of center of, of slavery. Um, and a lot of the library has been involved with this project as well. Um, from the beginning, we the library has advocated for the center and approaching the college for approval for the USS application and serving uh, library staff, serving as leadership roles in the academic research committee, as well as public history committee, working with students and faculty um, around these issues. So there, from the past, well, that's four to five years, has been really um, huge activity on campus to understand and create more inclusive, diverse, diverse history here um, at the College of Charleston. And so it is in this realm and conversations happening that we are undertaking a period of prescription at the college. Um, also, I might mention here that the part of the library system is the Low Country Digital Library and the Low Country Digital Initiative, um, also known as LCDL and LDHI. Um, both of these efforts of digital archive, digital exhibits have uplifted and increased awareness of hidden histories here in, in Charleston um, to really highlight and give um, the um, hidden or unrepresented people's uh, voices and stories into the larger narrative. So that is a uh, really pivotal part of the work in the, in the library system. Um, these working groups have been, if you look at the public history working group, is really interested in naming and who is represented in public memory and who is who isn't who isn't seen and acknowledged for their labor. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit later about how that is being um, embodied and um, displayed on campus. So I am one, uh, a member of the Archival Description and Discovery Working Group. Um, these are um, the members of the committee uh, working group here at the college and the library system it is comprised of archivists, processing archivists, catalogers, uh, reference archivists, and directors. And so it really, um, all the scope of technical services to, to public services is involved with the Archival Description Working Group. And this is a group that worked to implement, migrate, and create policies or archive space. So within um, this group is where all of the archive um, topics and issues are, are being discussed. And so this is where the, the idea of, pub, of a prepared description came from. Um, the special collection that Special Collection and Archives uh, was the department that kind of brought the idea for a period of description to the working group. And the working group uh, worked to implement and to um, find feedback to the processes. So um, 2020 um, was kind of the beginning um, time where the department of working group did research about what other archives and uh, libraries are doing around the pair description and having inclusive um, stories, looking at collections. Uh, and so a lot of research was done looking at SAA, the Archives of Black Lives Philadelphia, National Park Service, um, Temple University, Special Collection, the Research Center, 
National Archives, Princeton University Library of Special Collections, and the Archives um, Canada's LGBTQ um, plus archives. And so we knew that we were not working in a silo, and we thought it was important to understand the conversations around language, conversations around terminology, um, to place our work within the conversation. And so that was very, very important. And we knew we didn't want to duplicate, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, I should say. Um, people have always thought about these things, but the questions we had um, in the working group was around what is oppressive, what is harmful, and who is, who, and who, is harmful to, who is it oppressive for. Uh, and so that was really interesting conversation in the, in the working group to have got to know each other a little bit more as well at perspective. So that was a uh, really good um, bonding and communication across archives. So that was um, appropriate. The other conversation we had in the working group was what kind of actions do we want to take? Um, we wanted to work small and then go large. We want to make sure that we were doing this for the right reasons, that it wasn't just because it was a trend um, or popular, that we wanted to make sure it was a commitment um, by the archivist, by the library as a whole to make, take this seriously. And it wasn't something they wanted to take lightly. And so we took our time to really think through this um, so we wouldn't go at it um, you know, haphazardly. And so some of the reasons we um, understood as a group was we wanted to do this because we want to increase discovery of archival collections. We wanted to recognize the archival gaps and silences within collections. We wanted to provide an accurate description of collections. We wanted to acknowledge and correct white-centric or otherwise exclusionary language. We want to acknowledge the role of past staff in perpetuating white-centric or other exclusionary language um, within the finding gates. And uh, we created two statements. One was a brief uh, public statement that would go on the websites. And then we created a larger, a longer, I should say, reflective statement that kind of outlined um, the five things I mentioned earlier. We also posted the brief statement to our archive space instance and our on, on our web pages. Um, we are working. Uh, we also create a lib guide that really outlined the longer statement and some resources that we use I mentioned earlier for um, our context and to people to learn more about the you know, prepared description and why it is important. And we look forward to working and using archive space to really make these changes because um, we know archive space is flexible and we can make changes uh, much more immediately and can make it uh, accessible easier. So we appreciate archive space for that. Uh, we did, once we left the statement, left the committee, it went to the dean and the dean um, and the other executive um, members of the library reviewed the statement and approved the statement. So, um, and right now we, you know, future is to really publicize it a lot more in the public, but um, we'll get that in a minute. So one of the efforts that, you know, between 2020 and 2022 um, is around slave tags. Um, I'm not sure I mentioned you know about Charles' history, but this was uh, used by enslaved people um, to navigate the city. The slave owner uh, would purchase the, the, the tag and it was used by um, their, to, to hire them out basically so they can use their skill for, you know, for other purposes and the money was brought back to the slave owner. The historical language have referred this to as a slave badge, um, but in, and this was found on when this was found on campus due to an archaeology dig. It brought up the opportunity to reframe the conversation about badge versus tag. Um, the idea of a badge as a honorific term when really it is a symbol of oppression. And so this was opportunity for a cross campus conversation um, about naming 
and agency. And so now as a result of the working group and other and the CSSC, we are now referring to these items on campus as tax. And so that is a great um, achievement. Another example is of this uh, receipt book that is within the CFC um, archives. Um, this document um, shows the how enslaved an enslaved person um, named Peter Galtrich, his, his um, skills were used by the college to um, for painting, for painting on the laboratory. And so it is opportunity for this record to be um, described um, better, um, but it's just right now described as a receipt book, but to really highlight these stories. Because one thing, um, if you do research um, about in this period, a lot of people are, a lot of enslaved people are one, un, unnamed, and then two, not even um, recognized or described in collections. And so an uh, opportunity for the um, CFC archives to correct that and to add Peter's name, other folks' names in the record in the finding aid so that people can find, um, find him. Another example of uh, effort to uncover um, history of the colony and enslavement is uh, Bishop Robert Smith. He was the first uh, president of the college as indicated here, and he was an enslaved owner. And so the opportunity here is to uh, rewrite and um, not really rewrite, but in, in, um, edit his biographical note, right? So that we not just change subject headings, but we are changing uh, or editing and correcting um, to the biographical notes, not just to subject headings. So that is, that's great. Um, the other effort, um, not just for slavery, but moving you know, a little bit up in the history <laughs> is around suffrage and around um, women's activism. So the AV Research Center received funding from DPLA and Pivotal Ventures to do um, digitization, but also my data remediation. And so that was opportunity for us to, to do this work around highlighting Black women's activism here in Charleston, looking at club women. And so through this, we would get funding to hire um, a grad student to, to correct and add metadata to digitize collections that were previously described um, using the MPLP method. So our future work um, is very ongoing and we um, have plans and mentioned here. Um, we're gonna be creating a list of terminology and collections to review. Um, and we will be developing guidelines um, for, for this effort as well. Um, we're looking at the revision statement and archive space and other notes um, field in, in the system. And, please, and this is very much being placed in a larger conversation in the library and um, in the College of Retention and Diversity. Um, here are some resources um, that we've created. Uh, I mentioned sorry, I mentioned earlier, we did create a form that people um, can be can use to report any kind of uh, oppressive or um, harmful language that they think it should be. Um. Thank you so much. I look forward to Q&A. I'll now pass it on to Katie and Laura. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I'm Laura Friedman Shedlove at the University of Minnesota, and I'm here with my colleague Kate Dietrich. Uh, also from the University of Minnesota. And we both work within the archives and special collections department uh, at the university, the archive, which is known as ASK. Uh, it consists of about a dozen different collecting units within the university libraries. Uh, and just 
to give you a bit more background, um, the department was formed approximately 20 years ago from what was originally many separate collecting units. And over the years, we've been gradually working to centralize more and more of our functions and more of our uh, work. Uh, we created an online portal for our archival finding aids in about 2006, and we were initially using uh, DLXS uh, to power that, but we migrated to archive space in 2016, and our instance is a hosted instance. We, uh, in preparative uh, description efforts, have been happening in various contexts throughout the libraries for a number of years now. Um, notably, uh, we have uh, we had a big project uh, called the Umbra Search Portal that brought together materials regarding African Americans, both at the University of Minnesota Libraries and elsewhere. And there was a lot of um, reparative description that happened as part of the digitization efforts that were behind that. Uh, and there's been various other projects as well. But in 2019, um, our library's DEI leadership committee initiated a project to see if there were ways that it could help better coordinate and advance these efforts. And it began by coordinating some focus groups with various people in the libraries who had been involved with descriptive metadata projects and decided that the best way for that committee to help would be to articulate a statement of values and principles um, although we were, we are happy to share this uh, with colleagues, and I think Kate is going to put the link in the chat. Uh, this is, I just want to mention, an internally facing document that was intended to be a launch point for further work. Uh, getting this statement of values and principles kind of all the way up the administrative chain took over a year, but this upfront investment of time was worth it, we think, because it empowered uh, us uh, all the staff to do projects based on it without going through that process again. Uh, within ASK specifically, we have a description group which initially evolved out of our archive space implementation task force. And this group is responsible for managing our instance of archive space and overseeing descriptive practices across the department. Since the group was formed in 2019, it has focused largely on reparative description. Okay. So um, when we were kind of launching this work, we used um, all of this as our foundation, including uh, we took inspiration from other institutions. As you can tell, there's a lot of different places around the country who are doing uh, work like this. So we were looking at what other people were doing, but we knew that we didn't necessarily have the dedicated staff or a large chunk of time to do something comprehensive. But we didn't want that to stop us from doing anything. Uh, so we decided, you know, what can we do immediately to take any steps, no matter how small, to really start doing this work? So one of the things that we did was we created a historical language statement. And um, we linked that in the footer of all of our finding aids in archive space so that should someone come across offensive descriptive language, um, there is a link to the historical statement that um, contextualizes a little bit and also includes information uh, on how people can contact us and uh, inform us about that as we continue to work to remediate the language. We brainstormed a list of keywords for potential remediation, and we also created guidelines for tracking and noting these descriptive changes as we find them. We knew that we um, weren't going to be able to uh, do something that was extremely exhaustive or systematic, but again, we wanted to put you know, these small things in place to empower our colleagues to change things in the moment and guide them through doing that work. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned, we brainstormed a number of terms that we might potentially want to look at for remediation. We, uh, as staff members, just brainstormed lists of potential terms, and it's something that is continuing to grow as we encounter uh, and consider other terms. Next slide. 
And then, as I mentioned, we created these guidelines to help our colleagues as they encounter things. So some of the things that we suggested people do is that we really wanted to track the changes internally so we know who's doing this work, what kinds of language they are working on, uh, and how often. We suggested saving copies of previous versions of finding aids before they actually cha make changes so we have the old version and a new version. Um, we suggest that they add a revision note in a finding aid if the changes are made, and we came up with examples of what those revision notes would look like so our colleagues don't have to completely recreate the wheel as they're adding those revision notes. Uh, here's an example of a revision statement that Laura wrote. Um, we wanted to note if harmful language is retained in the finding aid and why that harmful language might have been retained. And then we just suggested citing sources um, as something that should be done as we, as archivists, create this descriptive language. Next slide. Everyone is muted. I'm not sure if someone is speaking, but every, so I don't know if Laura. Sorry, I was I lost my unmute button. I, I seriously I could not find it. And I found it. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry about that. So um, I'm going to just chat a little bit here about one of the pilot projects that we initially undertook. And I know I did see the request for the list of terms that was in the chat, and we are going to share a link to that. Um, and other resources and everything, I promise you, uh, very soon. Uh, so this pilot project, uh, this was uh, within one of our collecting units, the one that I formerly worked in, which was the Couts Family YMCA Archives. So in this project, it was an opportunity to try implementing the guidelines and uh, that Kate mentioned and the terms and some of the terms selected from that list that we put together uh, as a by the that was put together by the whole ask description group. And we utilized the archive space public interface, or I did, to search for um, terms and document them in the spreadsheet. So I, I just used the public interface for this, nothing fancy. And wherever I found them in um, the resource records for this particular collecting unit, I just listed them in a spreadsheet and where they were found. And then I made notes on the nature of the issue, uh, you know, with the term and a likely action that needed to be taken. And then as a sort of second step, I um, went through and started actually making changes to the resource records and documenting those changes uh, in, in various ways, well, both within the finding aid itself and in our own just keeping track of our own uh, you know, records of what kind of things we were doing and adding notes to the finding aid per the guidelines that we had established. Uh, and as part of this process, I really ended up reviewing not just the specific parts of the finding aid where the terms that I was searching for appeared, but actually oftentimes reviewing the whole finding aid or at least large parts of it, uh, because it just, as I was kind of, I in the end I had to really read the whole context for how the term was appearing. And in the process, other issues were uh, identified and addressed as well. So in the end, um, this project took, the, the project took approximately a month of part-time work. You know, I was doing other things at the same time. And during that time, I updated 34 different finding aids. And there is a report here um, that Kate just shared the link to that you can see. And again, I just wanna mention that this is just a, my own internal report. It wasn't ever, it wasn't written for publication broadly, but I'm willing to share it with folks who are interested, just if you wanna see more details of, of what I did and uh, didn't do and, and, and how it went. So, um, and now Kate's gonna talk about another pilot project that we did. So Lara really focused on one collection, uh, one repository, YMCA, uh, but we really wanted to do a separate project across all of the different units and archives and special collections. Um, and um, 
Oh, you want to go forward one more slide? I think it, there we go. Um, so we initially thought, well, maybe this would be a grant funded one year project um, that would be really great to have someone just focus on this work. And then we decided, no, that doesn't feel correct to have someone come in, um, fix our project, uh, fix our problems and then leave. So what we decided was the two co-chairs of the Ask Description Group, which is myself and my colleague, uh, Lisa Callahan, we decided to launch a systematic review across all 16 repositories, and we have about 7,569 finding aids. Um, and really what we were looking at was, we realized this as we were even thinking about a grant-funded project, was we didn't even know how big this was. Um, could this be a full-time position? Is this Would this be done in one month? How big is this project and how long might it take? So we decided to do this pilot project where we chose three keywords to focus on. And we chose those three words from our um, list of um, our spreadsheet of all the different uh, topics to, to look at. And what we did was we searched across all of the repositories and built a spreadsheet of every single instance of those three words. And we coded each one. We looked at it and said, this one needs to be fixed. This one we keep. This one could benefit potentially from a note uh, explaining a little bit more. Um, and then investigate for kind of the uh, things that we needed to potentially pull a box, pull a folder to determine, is that something that we would change or is that something we would not change? Next slide. So just those three terms, we found 7,346 mentions of them. Um, we found them in controlled headings, such as subject headings, which are potentially things we might not change, but also found them in things like biohist notes um, or in archival objects. So that could potentially denote language that as archivists we have created and we might want to change. So in doing this, we didn't actually uh, get to starting any sort of uh, remediation. We were just looking at uh, how big is the problem. We spent over 43 hours uh, surveying the terms and assigning tasks. We didn't even get to actually changing anything. So because of that, our basic takeaway is that this kind of work takes a lot of time. It also takes a lot of knowledge. And so the idea of bringing someone in who doesn't really know um, collections seemed just even more and more difficult. Uh, there needs to be a lot of investigation of determining, you know, do we want to keep this language? Is this language that was created by uh, the creator themselves, by us? A lot of more work needs to be done. It's a larger task than we realized, and it's not really work that could be farmed out or undertaken by, uh, for example, our student workers. Next slide. So our next steps, um, I think that we've really demonstrated the value of this work to our colleagues and that it takes time. Now we actually just need to do it. Um, <laughs> we need to actually start making those changes. So we did brainstorm a few ways that archive space changes could potentially assist us in this work. Um, it would be great if there was better search results export. So if you search for a term such as misses, you can export a search into a CSV, but we found that the, um, the export didn't necessarily give us all of the fields that we needed. Um, so that would be great if we could work on changing that. It would be great if there was a better display of search terms in the search results. So if you search misses and it's in the biohist note and that note is very, very long, it is hard to find that term and where it is located. It'd be great if we could potentially highlight where that search term is found. Um, and then it would be really great to have a checkbox to display a note that is um, that says that there's harmful language found in this finding aid. It'd be really great um, if that was something that was available to hosted instances and wasn't necessarily a plugin that is a little bit difficult for uh, those of us that, uh, for example, are 
hosted by lyricists. Um, so final thing, we are documenting our work in a lib guide. There's a link there. Um, and again, like Laura said, a lot of this stuff that we've created, we kind of did create more for an internal eye. We're happy to share it with you, but we apologize if there's a lot of acronyms. We weren't quite thinking about a larger audience for this. So thank you so much. Um, and we will go to our next presenters. Thank you all. I'm just going to share my slides. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Lexi DeGraff and Reed, Head of Collection Services at Penn State's um, Special Collections Library. Um, just an advisory in this presentation, I will be discussing a few very racist collections. Um, but while I will be showing pieces of archival description, I will not be showing content. Um, we have a medium-sized repository with a very small collection services team. Um, our work towards reparative description started in the summer of 2019 on a more case-by-case -case basis. We knew that the case-by-case -case was insufficient um, and that we wanted to do a broader assessment of our collections to get a better understanding of our needs and to move away from a small project-based approach towards a more programmatic approach um, in which more inclusive practices could be embedded at that point of accessioning as well as processing and throughout our digital collections workflows. So enter spring 2020, um, the COVID-19 shift to remote work provided an unprecedented opportunity to do reflection and assessment. Um, so as part of this, um, in my previous role as the processing archivist, I conducted a finding aid audit, audit of over 2,700 um, collection level resource records in archive space for their accuracy, compliance to DAX, and the existence of offensive language at the highest level of description. So this is really the finding aid front matter. This did not go into um, inventories um, or archival objects. So I've previously spoken about this project in terms of the resulting work to update our finding aids to minimal standard and mass, um, but I really wanted to focus on that last piece um, about offensive description. So confession time, um, this project was created very abruptly. So conversations about what exactly we were looking for didn't take place. Um, the early days of the pandemic, we all remember, were chaotic. So what I started with was a spreadsheet and the idea of I'll know it when I see it. Um, but as I went through the audit, my definition of offensiveness expanded from outright slurs and outdated language to the more subtle ways that finding aids could be offensive. So our definition of offensiveness grew to really mean anything potentially harmful, um, but especially absent language. So was the description of a collection documenting a marginalized community member so sparse that it wasn't discoverable or accessible to users? Obfuscating language, was the description so vague or euphemistic as to impede discovery and access? A failure of care, does the description as is demonstrate a failure of care to marginalized or vulnerable community members? So in doing this, we found a much wider net of obfuscation and absence. These silences in and of the, themselves were perpetuations of harm and violence, which worked to further erase the experiences of already marginalized groups for, with, um, represented within our archives. Um, so we formed an inclusive description working group um, to do more research and reflection on inclusive description needs and practices and to compile a resource guide for inclusive description. Ultimately, doing, um, due to our own capacity limitations, we hired a graduate student, Ben Mitchell, to help write the style guide for inclusive description. The resulting style guide did not reinvent the wheel on inclusive description. It really couldn't and it shouldn't. We relied heavily on existing research and built on the work of our many colleagues at other institutions who have already been doing this work. So the guide is less of a do it this precise way manual and more as a guiding document. It is a statement of principles and general principles that can be expanded on to approach collections of different marginalized communities responsively to their needs. Um, because this is an iterative process requiring constant language and learning and unlearning as circumstances and vocabularies change, 
We also didn't want to be so prescriptive as to mandate the exact language for each potential community that we might encounter within um, our repository. Um, and while we are doing this work, we were doing trying to apply some of these methods in our ongoing hybrid processing and redescription process. Um, and this working group has since kind of evolved into a strategic plan action team at the broader um, libraries level. So um, this excerpt shows the title of contents and goals section of the guide to provide the briefest overview of our intentions and framework for the guide. Um, we started with our goals and positionality and then moved on to general extensible principles on different pieces of archival description. We also importantly included a section on um, break these rules so that we can prioritize the stated preferences of different communities um, over our self-imposed rules. Um, and this guide is meant to be used by the collection services team in conjunction with our existing um, ex accessioning processing and other manuals kind of really programmatically as part of its work. Um, similarly, our resource guide, inclusive description resource guide points outward. It points towards existing works of theory, community driven thesauri and other style guides in order to aid our own descriptive efforts, as well as our learning. Um, this helps with staff training and serves as a resource to externalize our expertise and to try to enact a framework of cultural humility, which prioritizes slowing down and learning. Um, this is a living guide and we are committed to continuing to update it as um, we find new resources or new ones are created. So I updated it just last week as a new resource on um, trans, um, describing trans communities was um, released. So now I want to take a um, quick walk through a few short case studies of our reparative description work. Um, the first is of Grace Henderson and Delphi Weisendinger. Grace Henderson was the first woman to be appointed a dean at Penn State. She also lived almost her entire adult life with fellow state Penn State faculty member and AD Delphi Weisendinger. So at first, I completely missed their relationship. Um, Delpha did not appear at all in Grace's finding aid. And it wasn't until I got to Delpha's finding aid at about a thousand finding aids later that a small nugget of information popped out to me highlighted here, the longtime companion and housemate of Delpha Weisendinger, and that these two collections had come in together, but had been artificially separated by archivists. So this collection in an itself contains a lot of evidence of their relationship, including that they owned a house together, that they owned bank accounts jointly, and that Grace created a trust at the end of her life so that Delpha could inherit after her death. But there's complexity here. Neither Grace nor Delpha identi identified themselves as lesbians or homosexual at all during their lifetimes. They wouldn't have, probably, because Grace died at the beginning of the modern gay rights movement and likely never could have achieved her position being out. So we wanted to respect their right to self-identify or not. However, this is also an important piece of Penn State's queer history, and we didn't want to perpetuate the erasure of their lives. So. Um, what we really prioritized was adding Delpha back into Grace's finding aid, using the biographical historical notes in both finding aids to detail the facts of their relationship as we knew them. We used the related materials note to link the two collections together and updated the custodial history note to show the artificial separation of these collections by archivists. We also explained our reasoning in the processing information note by adding a note on archival description and creator agency to explain why we chose not to label either their woman as a lesbian or queer in the description. So we're hoping that this achieves some balance between respecting their silence and elevating their voices. My second example is a tiny collection of lynching photographs. Um, the original description for this was extremely sparse. It only had a title, an abstract extent, and nothing else. It was also highly problematic. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the original finding aid because I forgot to save it, um, but I do have the accession record. Um, the description in that accession record focuses only on the lynch mob's point of view and entirely assumed and perpetuated the guilt of Paul Reed and Will Cato. However, 
knowing the history of extrajudicial murders in this country, I was suspicious, and it only took me a quick Google search to find a peer-reviewed journal article of this murder, which led to completely overriding the description. Firstly, the context of the photographs needed explaining. These images exist because they were taken to be sold as souvenirs by a white businessman to members of the mob and others. This context is inseparable from the original captions mentioned in the accession record. In addition, is it is it is extremely dubious that these men committed the crimes in question. They were also tried, convicted, and ultimately murdered in just over one day. And the original description neglected to mention that after murdering Will Reed and um, Cato, the, man, the, the mob continued perpetuating violence against the local Black community. And this context needed to be brought into the record. So we created an extensive biographical historical note to contextualize these images. Um, we also chose to summarize the content of the images without using the captions in archive space, um, which had been created by the white photographer. So by adding the context, we hoped that um, to rehumanize these men and to not perpetuate the racist assumptions built into the original description. Um, my third example is a collection of racist greeting cards. The dealer had provided a description, however, it was completely inadequate because it exoticized the material and perpetuated racist stereotypes. Um, because most of the cards are caricatures of Black bodies, I pulled in our curator for African American collections to make a mutual determination about how to best move forward and balancing the original collector's use of racist stereotypes in their own classification of the greeting cards. Um, providing a content warning to researchers, but also not minimizing the harm of the collection's materials. We decided to lean into archive space's flexibility for collection level description. We retitled it the collection of races greeting cards to be very blunt about what the materials are. We sort of retained the collector's original classification. On the physical folders themselves, we wrote original file heading colon and then whatever it was, but we chose not to reflect those those folder titles in archive space to not perpetuate racist stereotypes in our public facing description. And we hope that that helped to contextualize those headings as the original collector's description and not ours. Um, because archive space allows for collection level description and not spelling out of all the folder titles, we just created one archival object for greeting cards and then used the processing information note to warn researchers about the original folder titles. Um, we also used the scope and content note to go deep into the ethnicities represented, themes, holidays reflected, in order to facilitate keyword searching, but also kind of serve as an unofficial content warning. My last case study is going to be about bilingual description on archive space, um, which is possible but challenging. Um, we wanted to have bilingual description of two incredibly important collections documenting 20th century Peruvian political history, because these chiefly um, are collections which were created in Spanish and are Spanish language materials. Um, we felt that it was essential that their access points be available in their original language in order to facil facilitate access and use to these materials. So deciding to do bilingual description was easy, but it opened up so many questions. Um, how are you going to represent bilingual description? If so, um, are the two languages going to be side by side or separated into two separate finding aids? Which language do you give precedence? Meaning if they do go um, into the same finding aid, what language goes first? What language do you title the folders in? Both languages, one language, which options are a better user experience for whom and for which users? What is the labor required for all of these options? What happens if you digitize materials? Where do you put the digital objects? And also importantly, so you've translated the text of the finding aid, but what about the structure of the finding aid? Can the users navigate an English language system for requesting materials if only the text of the finding aid is in Spanish? Or if, yeah, um, all of those are choices and they all have trade-offs and implications for access, use, and maintenance. Um, and I wanted to discuss the dis decisions and trade-offs that we made in order to have Spanish language description. So we decided that it would be best to have two, se two separate complete finding aids for each collection, one in English and one in Spanish. They have the same collection identifier as you can see here, but are distinguished from one another using their language code. 
Um, so one is the collection identifier dash EN for English or dash ES for Spanish. We felt that it would be a better user experience um, due to the length of those finding aids and that it would be ungainly for researchers to have to scroll back and forth between languages and that the, um, the experience would be more seamless. Um, the second decision that we made was to privilege Spanish language description because one, the materials are 90% in Spanish and it seemed more respectful. And two, any researcher using the collection would need Spanish language fluency to interact with the material. So I actually wrote the finding aid in Spanish first and then translated it into English afterwards. Um, we decided that the folders would be entirely in Spanish. So in the English Sp language finding aid, which is excerpted in the lower image, the finding aid hierarchy, i.e. the series titles are in English, but the title folder titles are still in Spanish. It would have been extremely labor intensive and not worth the time um, if researchers would need that fluency anyway. Um, the only thing I did translate in the inventory was the dates because that was an easy find replace in spreadsheet um, as well as um, it was really easy for me to just change aproximadamente into circa. Um, our other choices were harder. In our static old um, HTML finding aid site, I laboriously translated the entire structure of the finding aid into Spanish so that it wasn't just the text of the finding aid in Spanish, it was also all of the components of the site. However, the structure of our archive space PUI is in English, and we can't just change that for two finding aids. So Spanish speaking users will be able to understand the collection in their native language, but still have to navigate our systems and requests in English, which breaks my heart after how hard I worked for the first one. Um, one unexpected implication of having two finding aids is for our digital objects. Um, large sections of both of these collections are in the process of being digitized and added to our digital collection system. Um, currently, we're able to use our digital objects to link um, we're able to use digital objects in archive space to link to our digital collection system and display a thumbnail of the digitized item in archive space. But because of our how our local digital object guidelines are written libraries wide, each digital object can only be linked to the one archival object for digital preservation reasons. So our digital objects can currently only be linked to one finding aid and will ultimately be linked to the English language finding aid. Um, and the Spanish language finding aid will have a more general link to the digital collections. So I wish there was a way to move more fluidly between the English and the Spanish versions of a single resource record. But right now, that's just not how it works. But on the plus side, um, having the Spanish language finding aid had an immediate positive impact. We've had a number of um, research requests. It's been a significant uptick with several Latin American researchers requesting materials. And we even have documents from these from one of these collections digitized and on display as a facsimile in an exhibit in Lima at the moment. So this was a huge success that was really worth it. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, but this is a um, slide is to help discuss the challenges of reparative and opportunities of reparative description work um, in archive space. Um, for us, bilingual description has really been a challenge because it can't slit um, cleanly together um, as it currently is. Um, the reason we did the audit as we did is it's easier to look at the collection level records than to export our archival objects at the moment. So that's something that we need to do later on and hope to do to do that more reparative work. Um, certain things are a little hard to do, like versioning control, um, having to save that finding aid, like I, I forgot, as I admitted, um, that lack of versioning relies a lot on humans which have human error. Um, but archive space is so flexible that that flexibility is really key in doing this work in archive space because it's so extensible, um, because you can do so much with it. You can add revision statements. Um, also that the changes can be very immediate because all you have to do is push publish once it's been reviewed. Um, so it's it's really has allowed us to do a lot more with our finding aids fairly quickly um, to bring them up to standard and to apply the changes of our style guide. 
Um, so thank you very much. Um, here are some links. Um, I have a public Google Drive with the resources that I talked about for the style guide and the resource guide, and I will pop that into chat and then stop sharing my screen. Um, and then I want to thank the many people involved with this. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, a plugin that I wrote um, that models some of the potential behaviors that ArchivesSpace might like to see, or you know, users of ArchivesSpace might like to see um, around how we might label and contextualize uh, potentially harmful content that's represented in ArchivesSpace. Um, the plugin uh, that I'm going to talk about grew out of some of the work um, of a group I'm part of, which is the Dartmouth Library's Contextualizing Harmful Content group. Um, the current outcome of the group, which is still ongoing, um, is a statement on potentially harmful content. Um, right now, it's limited to our digital content because we wanted to take things a little bit slowly um, and sort of do things step by step. But we expect that that um, statement will expand to cover all or most of the library content. Um, one aspect of the group's work was to think about how we could take the sort of ideas that we were thinking about and make this uh, make a concrete example um, of this and how we might use that to alert users to potentially harmful content in some of the collections. Um, so I've in as I talk about this plugin, you're going to see some of the um, things that we talked about in our local group um, that are exemplified in the plugin. But again, those are um, things that are definitely up for change and would be things that the community as a whole should have input in if this were to be adopted more widely. Um, so again, uh, to reiterate that, the plugin is more meant to be a proof of concept um, and to spark more discussion about ways that institutions um, can envision labeling harmful content um, that, you know, and it's not meant to be the answer to the problem. So I'm hoping that this would uh, encourage collaboration on the development of plugin and perhaps lead to um, discussion about how some of these concepts might be incorporated into the core code. Um, and that would help eliminate some of the issues with hosted um, systems because of the, you know, the problems and the complexities of introducing plugins to those that environment. Um, so for, I'm going to sort of give an overview of what the plugin does um, and then go into a live demo. Um, and some of the overview is going to be a little bit technical because it talks about um, some of the things that are in the back end of archive space. Um, but hopefully the demo will illustrate a lot of that. Um, so the plugin provides staff users with the ability to add one or more labels to a specific record in archive space to indicate that the content may be potentially harmful. Um, the labels can be applied to resources, uh, accessions, archival objects, digital objects, and digital object components. Um, and those applied labels will be visible in the PUI. So I'm going to talk about the staff side first, and then I'm going to move on to the public side. Um, so on the staff side, um, what the plugin does is it adds a new controlled value list with tags, um, a list of tags that can be applied to those to any object. Um, that ta that control value list is editable. Um, so, you know, a staff user with the correct access rights can go in, edit that list, and as long as you update your locales files um, with the correct translations, you'll be good to go. Um, as I mentioned, it adds a new sub record to all of the different types of objects or descriptive objects, really, in archive space. Um, and the sub record contains two fields. So it contains a select menu from that controlled value list. And it also contains an optional free text field. And the free text field uh, is there to allow a staff user to add a description of why that tag has been applied to that specific content, um, rather than inheriting a more generalized description of that specific tag. Um, so if you wanted to contextualize why you've applied that tag more clearly, you would use that, that free text field. If you were just alerting somebody to the fact that this content may be harmful for you know, one, one reason or another, you could potentially leave that blank. Um, so here are a couple of uh, shots of the 
um, the plugin screens. Um, you can see the edit screen on the top left and then the sort of view mode on the bottom right. Um, and again, just illustrating that there's um, sub record and then the two fields that are present in that sub record. So on the PUI side, um, the plugin adds uh, several components. Um, it adds whatever tags are applied uh, by the staff user um, and sort of places those under the title. And uh, I'll have an illustration later on in the um, presentation. And then you'll also see that in the live demo. Um, the tags that are placed under the title are linked to an extra section in the accordion um, area of the PUI and where the details of those tags are included. Um, there's an option to link to a general policy statement um, if that's been provided. Um, if the, there are a couple, and this is where it gets a little bit technical. Um, if the plugin configuration is such that there's a general statement applied to all pages in the PUI, that specific link is omitted to provide, prevent duplication. Um, if not, then you'll see a link next to those tags. And again, moving on in the PUI, um, there's also a configuration option to enable a feedback form. Um, and this is an additional feedback form, um, very similar to the request form. And it would allow um, public users to provide feedback on the content that they're viewing um, to basically say, I found that this content was harmful because of this reason. Um, and the feedback form is an area that where additional testing and community development and feedback is really needed, I think. Um, also on the PUI side, um, there's an additional facet that can be configured um, to allow people to see um, the facet of a harmful content, whether harmful content has been applied to a specific object or not. And again, I'll have illustrations in the live demo. We'll hopefully show you a bit more about what this looks like. Um, so here's some screenshots of how the PUI would look with some of these um, tags applied. So the top left shows you a series um, with a warning directly applied to it. Um, and again, you see two shots here. One is the sort of title area with the title of the series, and then the tags that might be applied, in this case, just one, the harmful content general. Um, there's a button there that would trigger the um, feedback form. And then there's also the link to the sort of general policy statement. Um, sort of middle right is another illustration of that. This has two um, tags applied. And one of these demonstrates that you can have a custom description for a specific tag. Um, the third uh, set of, uh, the third illustration here um, illustrates an additional piece of this plugin. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but essentially um, objects that can inherit tags from their predecessors. Um, so for example, if a file lives in a series and the series has had tags applied to it, the file will inherit those tags, but will say that these tags have been applied at the series level. Um, this uh, screenshot illustrates um, one additional configuration option where you can specify that you want this statement to appear at the top of all of your PUI pages. Um, and again, this illustrates um, what I talked about a little bit earlier, where if you've enabled that specific configuration option, the individual warning um, sort of attached to the, the content tag section which was the why do we use these tags is not present just to prevent duplication because those two links point to the same place. Um, so we're going to get a little technical here um, and talk about some configuration options. Um, so I talked a bit about these um, in the previous couple of slides, but I'll go over them again. Uh, so we can add um, a configuration option to enable faceting on the staff and or PUI search results. Um, you can configure it so that you only display a general warning instead of the more detailed warnings. Um, this sort of option arose out of discussion that we had locally where we felt that we might not be in a position at this point at least to specify specific tags or not even know whether or not we were catching all of the types of harmful content that might be applied to 
a specific type object or piece of content. Um, the facet display changes depending on whether or not that configuration has been enabled. And I'll show you an illustration of that as well. Um, as I mentioned, you can add a link to uh, a statement um, about the, the content warnings or tags. Um, and that changes, again, changes depending on whether or not you enabled the global across all the PUI pages um, statement as well. Um, feedback form is another configuration that can be turned on and off. Um, and again, that's something that will definitely need some additional testing. All right, um, this is just an illustration of what the uh, fastening looks like uh, with or without that general only configuration option. To the left um, is with the general only turned on and to the right is with the general only turned off. Um, so you can see on the left, it just says may contain harmful content and says there are six things or you know eight things depending on which um, view you're in. And then on the right, it actually lists out the different types of harmful content that have been applied. Um, here's a, basically a screenshot of the um, feedback form. So basically ask for your name, your email address, and why you would feel that this content might be harmful. Um, and that in, in production would go to an email address or something like that, very similar to the way that the request form works. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the indexer because a lot of the magic happens there. Um, Additional for each tag that's applied to an object, uh, the indexer adds additional entries for each of those tags. It also adds a Boolean flag to say whether or not the tags have been applied. Um, there's a little technical reason for that. Um, then it adds a list of inherited tags for descendant objects. And again, this is where you have a file, for example, nested in a series. The series has been tagged directly, but the file is not the file will actually inherit the series tags. Um, and the way that that works is that it starts at the archival object or it could be uh, the digital object component, walks up the tree until it finds or it does not find uh, a directly applied tag. Uh, the inherited tags are displayed on the PUI, but not on the staff side. And again, that's the example that I've been talking about here. Uh, the plugin also modifies exports and um, PDF, or so EAD, EAD3, and PDF exports for both the staff and PUI side. Um, so the exports now contain those harmful content tags. Um, digital objects and digital object components is a work in progress for modifying those. Um, part of the reason for that is that to update these exports, you need to override the core code, um, and that presents a little bit of additional complexity in the plugin. Um, again, if the general only configuration option has been set, uh, the exports contain only that general tag. Otherwise, each of the uh, tags that had been applied to an object are included in those exports. Um, in the case of exports, inherited tags are not included um, just because you're seeing the context of the entire finding aid in one spot rather than an isolated object. Um, in this current implementation, I've chosen to use an odd tag for the additional data in the EAD and EAD3 exports. That's one of those things where, is there a better way to express this? Um, and I think the community could have a lot of input on that. Um, as far as reports go, um, it adds one additional report to the application on the staff side where you can essentially get a list of all of the objects that have had tags applied. Um, and it includes the name of the object um, and what tags have been applied. So just an example of what the exports might look like um, for EAD and EAD3, standard odd tag um, or odd um, fragment. And then on the PDF side, again, looks pretty similar to whatever else you might find in the PDF. And this is just a sample report export. Um, so you see a description of the tag, title of the object, the type of object, and then the code that's applied to the, that object. And the description in this case would be if there's a custom description applied to that object. So that free text field that I talked about earlier has been filled out. All right, demo time, where hopefully most of this will become clearer. So I'm gonna bounce over to my browser. 
Um, so I'm running this locally, uh, and so it's basically set up exactly the way the plugin would come. I have a couple of different configuration options turned on, and I'll talk about those as we get there. Um, so this just shows the um, new controlled value list uh, with some of the um, types of harmful content that I thought might be interesting or useful to include. Um, here's the, the live uh, result with, um, and in this case, I don't have the general only turned on. So you see that you have the um, specific types of tags um, listed here under the facets. If we move on to a, uh, a resource, um, you can see there's a new sub record down here. Um, this is in view mode, sorry about that. Um, and you can see that there are two tags applied to this resource, one of which has a custom tag apply, or custom description. If we go into edit mode and go down to harmful content, you can see that's where that is. Um, the view mode picks up either the custom description or the um, generic description that's applied to that specific tag, depending on whether or not that custom description is present. Um, so you can see this is another illustration of um, uh, an archival object, again, with two tags applied, just to show that it can be applied to both resources, archival objects, accessions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, moving on to the PUI, which is probably a little bit more interesting. Um, so this is just the homepage of the generic PUI that you see. In this case, I've enabled the um, configuration option to include the link to the, potent the statement or policy statement on all pages. Um, so you can see this across the top. And I'll stop, pause to say that the styling here is very, um, very quick and dirty. <laughs> um, and this would be something that obviously needs some UX work. Um, moving right along, uh, this is just a search screen to show you um, the faceting in the PUI. Again, this in this case, I don't have general turned on. So you're going to see the individual types listed. Um, for a collection, um, this is uh, just a content, a, series, a resource with uh, two tags applied. Um, you can see it's two tags here. These actually, when they're added, link down to the accordion section. So it just drops you down so you can actually see why those tags are applied. Um, so this triggers, again, the feedback form for the, you know, if you wanted to allow the public to interact with you and suggest additional warnings, um, that's how that would work. Um, and these next two screens are going to show you basically the difference between um, a file that has tags applied directly and a file where those tags have been inherited. So this is a file with a tag that's been applied directly. And you can see it has two tags. Um, it has the accordion section down here with the description of those two tags. And this file does not have tags applied directly. These tags are being inherited from the series level. Um, so in this case, if you look over in the collection organization, there's a series with a warning here. The indexer, as it moves to collect data, has basically looked and said, okay, this file is a child of this series. This file doesn't have any applied tags, but the series does, so the file inherits this series tags. Um, and there's some language that basically says, okay, it's applied at the series level, and then links you to the series where that's applied. Um, that's really, I'm gonna bounce back over to the PowerPoint. Um, and right now it's available on GitHub. Um, it supports 311 and 320. Um, I'd encourage people to take a look. Um, pull requests and changes are really encouraged. And um, to sort of reiterate what I said at the beginning of the, the presentation, it's more meant to be a proof of concept to get people talking about how this might be done in an archive space context um, and how perhaps this could influence some of the decisions that might be made around including some of this functionality in core. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop sharing now um, and turn it back over to Jessica. All right.
Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move into our Q&A. We do have a few questions already popping into the Q&A. Um, if you do have questions, please make sure you're putting them in the Q&A. That's what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at the chat. I know there's a lot happening in the chat, so I'm going to be reading from the Q&A. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive in. Sarah asks, for the University of Minnesota folks, for the historical language statement in the footer of your finding aid, do you have any metrics of people clicking on that and engaging with the statement? I'm wondering how effective a footnote link is versus a pop-up or a link higher up on the page. Yeah, so um, we don't actually have metrics uh, for that. Um, we put contact information of, uh, you know, if, if you find something, please contact us. Uh, no one has contacted us. And I don't know if that means that we have absolutely no problems or if people simply can't find it. Um, we entertained a few different ideas of potentially putting a note in every single finding aid as opposed to in the footer. The footer was the easiest, quickest way to get this done. Um, and we also briefly talked about a pop-up, but decided that um, that wouldn't be suitable for a number of reasons, including um, accessibility reasons. I'll also just note that because we have a hosted instance of archive space, we're also a little bit more limited as to how we can experiment with these things, because we have to go through Lyricist for any of those kinds of changes. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question for both of you, uh, are those revision statements published? Yes. yes. That, and that example, if you're talking about the revision statement in the finding aid, mm -hmm. that screenshot, that, that was from the public user interface. And if you follow the link uh, to that finding aid, which um, we had shared before and which I can share again. Uh, you can see it, it it's down in the um, administrative information section of the finding aid. Thanks. All right, um, Sarah asked for the Dartmouth PUI, is there a document that could be shared with the various harmful language tags in the scope note descriptions of each of those tags? So the answer is no, because it's still in development for us as well. Um, I, I think we mentioned it's sort of a beta phase where it's working, but I would really like to get more feedback from the community before mm -hmm. it becomes an official sort of plugin. Um, there's an additional layer of complexity for Dartmouth um, for us specifically in that our PUI is heavily, heavily customized. So for any plugins that even I write at this point, um, there's the core plugin, and then there are additional overrides that we need to make on our side for our PUI customization. So there's a sort of secondary layer of complexity, which is a long way of saying no, but we'd love to have that. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. And and for anyone that's interested, obviously, um, all of the links to the presentation slides and all of the resources will be shared with the recording on that link that I shared in the chat earlier, but there already is a link in the description of Joshua's presentation out to GitHub. So if you are interested in this plugin and want to go ahead and start poking around, please feel free and give it a, a try. Like, like he said, um, it's very much in beta phase and looking for, um, for feedback. To that end, Sarah asks, um, have you done any user testing or gotten any informal feedback? from researchers. Yeah, and again, the answer would be no, because we haven't released this yeah. into any sort of public uh, form yet. Um, what, I, and again, to stress this, I would really like to get feedback from the community first yeah. uh, to make sure that those things, that the community needs are being met. Yeah, thanks. Um, Brianna asks, I don't think it would, but does the feedback form export as EAD? No, um, there are some questions that I have, and this might be more detailed than is necessary for this specific forum. Um, but I have questions about how some of this data should be stored in archive space and whether it should be stored in the database. Um, right now, none of the tags, descriptions, um, labels, anything like that, they're all in locales files. Um, and the feedback form is really generated by a JavaScript. 
And the question is, should we capture any of that information in the database um, in a sustainable way? Thanks. Um, going back to Laura and Kate, uh, I think you mentioned including in, a, including in a revision note that actions weren't taken. Could you give an example of one of the instances where an action wasn't taken and how you made that decision and how you communicated it in the note? Sure. Um, actually, I think the main, and Kate maybe can speak to this as well, but I think the main thing we were thinking of there is situations where we retain language because it is um, original language that is part of the collection material and that there isn't any way we can really alter that but we so th I think that's the kind of situation and actually the example that I shared previously is is one of the it does show one way that we documented that like uh, the last sentence that says a content warning note was also added regarding language that was retained so that would be one example. And Kate, I don't know if you have more to add. Yeah. Um, so one example, we have the social welfare history archives here, and uh, they have a collection of uh, federal government publications related to social welfare. And so, um, for example, a title of one of those publications is the mentally retarded child at home. And so if someone is looking for that publication, they're gonna search exactly for that title. And so we don't want to change the name of that. Um, and so I, in speaking with the archivist in charge of that collection, we were trying to brainstorm the best way to um, add notes that explain that, um, that information, that language is kept because it is historical language. And uh, I'll add, this is Lexi at Penn State. Um, we also use the processing information note um, rather than, so the revision statement note is just like, for us is just so-and-so made these changes on this date. And then we'll use the processing information note to talk about the why. Um, and sometimes it's the why of why we did change something or the why of why we didn't change something. Um, and usually that has to do with we retained the original folder titles created by the creator or the collector, or we retain titles of publications, but this may contain this type of information, or um, we retained, um, I'm thinking of the homo files of Penn State, we retained the, that was the original name. So we retain, it shows the changes in the language within the LGBTQ community over time. So just indicating those types of like, why we made those changes, we use that more in the processing information note than in the um, revision statement. Thanks. Um, this is a question for everyone. It's a good question. In doing this reparative work and re-experiencing trauma, were your supervisors supportive, particularly as it relates to taking time and self-care? And um, what types of self-care did you find helpful? Uh, I'll start. Um, this is Lexi again. Um, yes. Um, so um, our head and my the former head of collection services were incredibly supportive, um, especially for some of the material for the 20th century Latin America stuff that could be pretty um, awful in regards to um, political violence. Um, and then now in my position as a supervisor, um, I try to tell people, you know, we can switch, we can walk away. Um, so no one has come to me with things, but I've tried to preempt of like, if this is hard, you can take a break and walk away with it, away from it. Um, and that's also been the word from my own supervisors. Um, so sometimes you can switch to a different project um, or just take a walk, take a break. Yeah, um, Aisha here. Just wanna, um, I think also time to share with everyone, you know, just time to talk about those processes and archival procedures with our colleagues as a time for self-care as well. So I think that is part of not just keeping it bottled inside, but, you know, talking about it with other colleagues across the library or other departments is a way to also do self-care. And I think part of self-care is also sharing in your discomfort and sharing with what you do and don't know and pr providing that opportunity to for people to say oh I don't know the best way to do this or you know 
allowing that uncertainty um, to be in there. It's something to discuss. So for a number of our collections, um, we'll go back and forth between colleagues um, about the language to use so that it's not one person prescribing. It's kind of um, going to um, a community-driven um, source of information and then thinking about it and talking about it a little bit um, and creating a space for people to be wrong um, or for people to be comfortable with being not sure on the best way to move forward. And I'll add that we, uh, in the University of Minnesota Libraries in our ASK department, we recently started scheduling um, some group sessions where folks from across the department who may be um, attempting to, to get started on this work can have like kind of scheduled times to talk about it together and, and even just work on like a working working sessions. We're still early on in that. So um, I'm not sure exactly how people will use it, but I do envision that those kinds of discussions uh, will be part of it. Thank you all. That's a, it's a good question. So I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to answer if they'd like. All right, uh, we have two more minutes um, and we have, there's one question in the chat that's being, uh, answers are being typed. So I'm not going to uh, address that one, uh, but there is one final question. I'm going to go ahead and ask and then, and that will be the last question. Um, it's a question about feedback forms and providing feedback <laughs> forms. Have you talked about the option for patrons to provide anonymous feedback? Um, and Karen lists some reasons why you may or may not want to do that, but have you um, considered anonymous feedback forms? So Karen, we have actually an internal feedback form. We call it the description feedback form. Um, and that's been internal. And when um, patrons have reported to us, um, the staff has filled out that form on behalf of the patron. Um, it had been a discussion about putting a public form on the front end. And um, I my intention for that would be like, you, it doesn't prompt you for an email address necessarily, or like making that optional, but um, that hasn't come back up very recently, but it's something I would like to explore. Yeah, I, I think as far as the, the plugin feedback form, that's a really great question. Um, you need to sort of balance the the spam aspect of things versus the the harm that you could be doing by subjecting somebody to requiring them to provide more personal information. Yeah, we um, we the name is optional and email is optional, um, and either is a Google form. Um, we ask if they want to follow up. Um, about their concern that they provide their information. Otherwise, it's not required. Great. Thanks. All right. We are at time. Well timed. Um, thank you so much to, to our panelists for being willing to present today on, on this topic. This was really helpful. There was a lot of good information and a lot of different ways to to address this work. So I thank you all of I thank all of you for being willing to commit your time. Um, it's always a commitment, but right now everything just seems a little bit heavier and a little bit more to take on. So I appreciate all of you uh, for your willingness to do this. I thank you everyone that stayed until the bitter end. Um, and thank you for your questions. Uh, again, the recording and, and slides and links will be um, available in the coming days. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you all so much. And I look forward to seeing you at the next Archive Space event. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>